they have a passion to try and find out the solution to interesting problems. Science is going to be about reconstructing cellular activity. Michael Berridge and Robin Irvin are old friends. Coming from completely different fields of science, together they changed our understanding of cell signaling. Mike was a, a cell physiologist who knew a huge amount about calcium cyclic AMP and so on, uh, but didn't know one end of an anostol ring from another, whereas I was an anostol lipid biochemist who really didn't know a lot of cell biology. So our complementarity in our skills was good for both of us, but obviously for me to end up involved in something that was so uh, important, I mean that's just one of those strokes of luck. Everybody hopes happens to them, and it happened to me. It's over 30 years since their groundbreaking collaboration began. Today they've met up to talk about Mike's life's work. How did you first get into it? Because you were brought up in Rhodesia, as it was called then. Um, and what sort of influences helped you on the way? It was a magical place for a young boy growing up. And I just developed a great love of the, the wildlife, basically. And when I got to school, I came along with this, this sense of wonder about biology and had this tremendous biology mistress, Pamela Bates. I, at that stage, I was sort of leaning, perhaps, to doing medicine. But then one day, Pam laid out this bull's eye for us to dissect, and I just passed out. <laughs> I couldn't do it. <laughs> so she finally, she brought me around, and I was, you know, obviously being very embarrassed about it, but I, I remember saying to her, you know, I don't think I can do medicine now. <laughs> you know, I just... <laughs> And she was so reassuring, she said, now look, don't worry about that, because you can do research. Michael came over to Cambridge University in the UK to do his PhD under Sir Vincent Wigglesworth. It was remarkable to come and work with, essentially, the father of insect physiology. Tremendously inspiring to work with somebody like that. Michael was working on the salivary glands of flies, but he soon realised he'd need new techniques to progress further. And it was then that I, I had to become a biochemist. <laughs> <laughs> Beginning of a steep and slippery slope. It was indeed. <laughs> the problem that interested Michael was how a hormone made a cell secrete saliva. We all need to respond to our environment. That process begins at a cellular level. A signal reaches the surface of a cell, but how does that make it change its behaviour? What's happening inside? Michael knew that calcium was involved, but that wasn't the whole story. Calcium has a number of chemically unique properties that enable it to bind to proteins so they can change their conformation, and, and that is how signaling works. But calcium is not something that cells want to have freely roaming inside. When you have high calcium, phosphate precipitates out. So we had to get calcium out of our cells when life very first evolved. And since then, we've been living under this kind of threat of the high calcium outside the cell. And a good analogy is if you go to a wedding uh, and somebody pitches the tent badly and there's a thunderstorm, you get this great um, sort of overhang of water and you go and look at that, gallons of water straight above you. Now, if you wanted a drink, you could poke a hole in the tent and you'd probably drown. Now there's another way you could handle calcium, and that is you could have buckets of water to collect drips. And what you do is you want to send somebody over there to open a tap in a bucket and get a drink. And that somebody is IP3. And that really is at the nub of, of what Mike discovered. IP3 comes from the inositol lipids found on the cell membrane. Michael thought that IP3 might be that crucial chemical messenger that connects the hormone outside the cell to the calcium stores inside. It was Bob Michel in Birmingham about eight years before who had suggested there is a link between inositol lipids and calcium, though that link was not clear. Something happened when you stimulated cells to their inositol lipids and then the calcium increased. And it was really set for Mike to realise that it was IP3, which was being produced from these phospholipids, by the breakdown of these phospholipids, that could be that second messenger. Because then I realised I should really look at these inositol phosphates. And I started running columns, expected the two peaks, inositol and inositol 1-phosphate, and there were these other two peaks. 
And I think I showed you these, I had no idea. And immediately you said, well, that must be IP2 and that's IP3. <laughs> you know, so, okay, well, how do, we, how do we sort this out? In order to prove that IP3 was the messenger, Michael needed to show that it peaked before the calcium did. I remember quite distinctly um, when I did the experiments and I was actually watching the as you do when you do an experiment, you dash to the yeah, counter to try and you count <laughs> yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And I suddenly saw, you know, the one second thing. It was already up. Reading the IP3 yeah. was up. Yeah. And I remember being so excited. You know, it was a real kind of eureka moment yeah. that this must be the way it works. It's, right. This is the, the second messenger. So IP3 was being produced in the right place, the right time. And now the question is, okay, so can we actually establish that IP3 is doing that? And you know, you can look back on it and say, well, no, it's obvious, isn't it? I mean, really, it, it, with the benefit of hindsight, it's obvious. But the thing about breakthroughs is they're only obvious after they've happened. And in fact, the idea that IP3 was the second messenger that was released from the cell membrane, went into the cell, opened those taps in the buckets of water, released the calcium from inside the endoplasmic reticulum. That was the crucial breakthrough. That's what excites me, is unsolved problems, and seeing whether I have the tools to try and at least understand it, try and understand what this phenomenon is. As we learn more and more about the molecular events that go on inside mm. a cell, mm. putting the whole thing back together again into a tissue, into an organ, into the whole function, mm. is really a, going to, a challenge that is, is a completely different sort of challenge that I think is going to be very, very difficult. You mustn't overemphasize the difficulty, you must also emphasize the excitement. The development of imaging has just completely transformed our, the calcium signaling field. Oh, we knew quite a lot, but compared to what we know now yes. about the precision of the calcium signal, the, the spa both spatially -temporal and temporally, thing, absolutely. and that's the key to the, the signaling mechanism. The cell is not a bag of water, it's highly structured and space and time are absolutely what signaling is about.